Well, good morning. How's everyone this morning? Glad to see you all here in person and welcome to everyone that is online this morning. We're so glad to have you join us this morning. It's a beautiful 4th of July weekend. God has been so good and so gracious to us. Let's go to uh, our call to worship this morning. It actually comes from Psalm 143, verses 8 through 10. Hear what the psalmist says. He says, let me hear of your unfailing love each morning, for I am trusting you. Show me where to walk, for I give myself to you. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord. I run to you to hide me. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me forward on firm footing. This is a, this is a passage that I could literally roll out of bed, open up my Bible, and read each and every day. Because it's, it's starting off the day before I do anything. It, it, trusting in the Lord. Telling me how to walk in Him. And giving myself fully to Him. And, you know, Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God and then love your neighbors yourself. But He also said love your enemies. And that's exactly what it's saying here. Uh, even though it says, rescue me from my enemies, we need to turn around and then love on them. Because it is only through love that we can uh, institute any kind of change. And Pastor Mark and I have been talking about this recently. How do we change? It's one person at a time, one heart at a time. And then certainly through the messages that we give, through the Bible studies, through the way that we interact with people, we teach how to do those things so that we can truly say that God is our God. Father, we just thank you for the words that you give us, Father, this love letter that you have given to us, Father, so that we can know how to live in this world but not of this world. Father, let us walk through life doing exactly what these verses say. Let us trust in you. Let us be your, let you be our guide so that we can go out into your world and take it for your kingdom. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, thank you, Terry. So I chose the song today because it really speaks to me and what I think the world is going through uh, today and what we're going through and what we're seeing in the world today. I think this really speaks to it. Uh, that we have to understand that God does have unfailing love for us. Regardless of what we do, regardless of what we say, he's got unfailing love for us. That love never goes away. So we need to be able to trust in him first. And that's kind of been a theme that I've been talking about for the last few weeks. And and because uh, I really think right now in this world, and I think you'll see as we go through the sermon today, Kind of think about that as, as a recurring theme as we think about all of the stuff that we're going to cover. And today is going to be kind of a, a coverage of some of our study that we're doing on Wednesday nights. And some of it's going to be the season, the red, white, and blue, a little bit of Fourth of July in with this in here. So I'd like to start off this morning and calling us to worship with God. And I would like to open this up for a prayer for our nation. Lord, we come before you right now and we ask that you would dissolve the barriers that hold us apart from each other, that would separate us for doing your commands. And that greatest command was to love one another as we love ourselves. And I think that is one of the things that this world is really truly lacking today, Lord. So we just ask that you would bless us and overcome the world with your love and help us to overcome the world with your love as well lord and as we come together today open our ears to hear and our hearts to accept your message and lord open our eyes to see the blessings of your world that you give us each and every day so father god as we come forth to hear your message today i just ask that you would anoint each and every one that's able to hear it and see it and to accept this message into their hearts and that 
we can truly change the world when we do those things and when we reach out in love to one another. Amen. So I wanted to kind of start off today, and this is, uh, if you want to, a Civics 101 lesson as well as a sermon. Um, so it, it's uh, kind of fun. As I was writing this, uh, I had a lot of things kind of bubbling up in me, and spending so many years with the Freedom Festival uh, in there and the different roles that I had, and as the president of the Freedom Festival, uh, I got up and, and gave a, an address on July 4th uh, downtown Cedar Rapids and I started off with the words so people would understand where we are coming from and where we've been and that's kind of part of the theme of my message today so when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind require that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute a new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So that's our Declaration of Independence. And I found years ago that there were so many people who had never read those words, who didn't really know those words. They're Accepted. Every, every new person coming into the United States has to go through a class and they have to know these words. But we as citizens of the United States, we don't have to go through those. And unless you go through a civics class or something, you probably never learned them. But they're very, very important because this is the basis on which we founded this very nation, our society. So the men who wrote the Declaration of Independence were some of the most intelligent men of their times, and what they were doing was no, nothing short of a living sacrifice. They left everything they had known, their entire lives, their families, to pursue freedom of religion, freedom of expression, and especially that the concept that everyone is equal in the eyes of God. They believed from their very core that these freedoms were endowed by God the Creator. They took the words of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark to heart. And in Mark 8.34 it says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And see, such as that is the journey of Jesus. And that is what our nation was founded upon. And we are called to sacrifice ourselves as we go through as we believe and as we follow Jesus. And we as pastors, we think that's kind of like Christianity 101. Everybody should know this, and it should be a, a foregone conclusion. But it's not. It's not. And we have to understand that as we go through that journey and as we turn ourselves over to Christ and as we go and journey as Christ journeyed, it's an arduous task to do. It's an arduous journey to undertake. It's not going to be an easy one. And we have to be aware of the fact that our way can be lost if we refuse the Spirit. Our way can be lost if we do not obey the words of Jesus, and our way can be lost if we do not tolerate the demands of love. 
And I talked about that love fulfillment in the call to worship today in that Psalm 143, where God has unfailing love. And a lot of us misinterpret what that means. And, and the verb that's used in there for love is not something that we feel. It's not a phileo love, which is the term for that. It's not a physical love. See, that love is more something that we do rather than what we feel. And as a verb, love is always transitive, which means it, it changes depending upon a direct circumstance that you're connected to at that point in time. So love can mean a myriad of things. Love takes on a myriad of things as we are exposed to it. And we are called to love one another, and that's not just simply a physical love, but it's a, a way of existence with unity for one another. And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about that love of unity, that love of being with one another. And thus Jesus command to deny ourselves and love one another in a community. Because if we have that love, if we have that underlying love for one another, in unity with one another, then we wouldn't be in the state that we're in, in this nation right now, and in this world. And we need to do it for the sake of our own souls and for the body of Christ, for the churches we lead, and for the world that God loves. The way of the cross remains the way of true life. And as so as we journey forward with Jesus our as our example, we journey forth in love with one another. In the same way our forefathers did because they saw that they had this relationship with God and it was paramount to them being in community with one another and having fulfilled lives. The Declaration of Independence states it. They talked about God the Creator and how the principles are founded upon that. So our scripture today that we're going to be studying comes from Romans 12, 1 through 13, and it centers us on being a living sacrifice. But we have to ask ourselves at that point in time, what does that mean? Because normally when you think about a sacrifice, something's going to die. And you're right. We have to die to our old selves. We have to die to our old selves. Sacrifice ourselves to the body of Christ. Meaning we're giving ourselves wholly and totally to the service of others through Christ. That's what a living sacrifice is all about. So Romans 12 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And in the past, animals were living or were used as a living sacrifice to atone for the sins of man. But when Jesus came, he offered himself as a final sacrifice once and for all to atone for those sins to pay for those sins and, and for man's sinful nature. So if we read that verse that Paul is writing in there, we're going, well, why is he writing this? If, if Jesus has already paid the price, why do we have to be a living sacrifice? And Paul at that point in time was asking Jews and Gentiles alike was to conform their lives to the example that Jesus set for them while they were here on earth. And when we think about the word conform, we have to understand that when you're conforming something, you're changing it. You're molding it and, and making it into something new. And so he's saying, conform yourselves to the likeness of Jesus. Conform yourselves to the way that he lived his life. A living sacrifice, a living example of Christ. And so that's what he's asking us to do. And Paul goes on in verse 2 
And he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So we need to forget about the way that we used to think about things and, and how we were self-serving and self-centered. And we need to transform our minds. We need to take the world in a different view. We need to change our perspective. We need to change that worldly view that we had and make it into a godly view instead. We need to realign our thinking to serving others first and then acting as one body in union with one another. To realign our serving of others first instead of ourselves. And we need to hold each other accountable for the greater good of the body of Christ. And we were talking in here today with, with a couple of people after their service in here. And that's exactly what she said was wrong was that, you know, they're not being held accountable for their actions and what they were talking about. They were saying one thing and completely wanting to do something different. And we find ourselves in that quandary very, very often in life. And, and it's a real thing, but we need to transform our minds to think differently if we're to journey our lives with Christ as our focus. Paul goes on to address this, starting in verse 3, and we need to think about that as humble servants in the body of Christ. For by the grace given to me, I say to each and every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than what you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with memory, many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then Prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. And if it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. And if it's to lead, do it diligently. And if it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. See, and if the body of Christ, if we are to follow these tenets, as he says in here, as he lays it out, and we can follow those fully with our lives and let our community know in the process. See, that's, that's it. We, we tend to bottle it up and hold it inside, and nobody knows what, what we believe. Nobody knows how we should run our lives. What if we don't tell anybody that they have a love, an outstanding love that is unending. What if they go through their entire life not knowing the love of Christ? How, how are we as Christians been the body of Christ? We haven't. We haven't done our job. We haven't lived out those tenets that Christ calls us to do. And we need to do it cheerfully. I'm here today to save your life. Let me tell you about Jesus, and here's why. And see, when we do that, when we do that, we have a lot of people though, that go through life every day asking themselves, hey, is this all there is? Is this it? Is this all there is to life? Is this as good as it gets? I feel trapped in my life. We need to reach out to them Love on them. Terry says that all the time. We need to love on that person. We need to love on them. We need to tell them there's more to life, but more importantly, we need to show them the way. Words are cheap. Actions speak louder than words. We need to show them the way. Put our love into action. And see, this section in Romans is, is really, really a great outline for us to live our lives by. 
Paul starts talking about putting our love into action. In verse 9, it says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. And see, to me, this whole section in Romans seems like four different sermons all wrapped up into one. And it really is. Because it really speaks to how we need to live our lives and how we need to be in community with one another and how the world would be a better place, our community would be a better place if we just simply followed those tenets. It's easy. There's nothing hard there. But see, this is the journey that Christ calls us each to take. The life he calls us to live and the love and hope that we can share with those who are in need. Those who are asking those questions, is this all there is? Is this as good as it gets? No, it's better. It's a lot better. They need to see that hope in love. We need to share it with them. The fulfillment that we receive when we're able to bless that other person by telling them these things and showing them we, we get as much blessing as they do. We get that blessing back to us. And according to the scriptures, it re returns to us several times over. We have something to look forward to, to be able to do this. There's not a cost. You get a benefit from it. And see, that's what it is to be a living sacrifice. To be a living sacrifice means to go out and serve those others who are in need who are hurting in this world, who don't have hope. We sacrifice ourselves to help them out as the body of Christ. So you notice in there, not once did I ever say you had to give up your life. You don't have to give it up. You don't have to give it up. But see, in order to live your life fully, you need to start living it for others. In order to start living your life fully, you need to live it for others. Christ's example when he was here on earth was living his life fully for others from beginning to end. A living sacrifice. The Declaration of Independence was written to give notice to a tyrannical government and it was ruling their lives. It was overbearing and sought to control people. And see, this declaration was to free them from this life and give them a fresh start and to live life according to the will of God. It's written right into the paperwork. So many of you don't know, but I study history, and for many years I built exhibits at the History Center and at the African American Museum and the Science Station. See, I, I wanted people to know what the history was. I wanted people to be able to look back and see what worked and what failed so they could see the good and the bad of where it came from. It gives several generations a look to see who we were as a community, what we were doing, how we were living, and as a people, perhaps how we could even do it better going forward. And the biggest part of that is how we can build a better community in the process. And it's a very simple thing to do. But if you don't look back at the past and learn from the mistakes of the past or see what didn't work, we're doomed to have that same future. There's one thing that history has taught us is that history repeats itself and can be good or can be bad. And if we learn from the, the past, then the future will be better as we build that community into a better place. And that's the journey that Jesus took. 
He talked about the past and reminded those who would listen how things can and will be better if we follow him. See, it wasn't all about the present with him, just like it's not all about the present right now where we are. He reminded the people of where they came from. He reminded them of God's unfailing love through it all, through all the trials, the tribulations, the good and the bad. God was there the entire time, and he saw it through no matter what man did at that point in time, what he did right or wrong. God was there the whole time. And Christ, as a living example, was showing that is the way that we are to be the body of Christ. So, have you ever thought about the Bible as being a history book? See, it's a book filled with answers of what not to do. What not to do. We should be looking at that going, okay, this tells us what we shouldn't do in our lives. But the neat thing about it is, is it also flips it over and says this is what we should do in our lives as well. If we live by the spirit of holiness, then these things will be revealed to us as we journey through life. We can get lost if we refuse the spirit. We can get lost if we do not obey the words of Jesus. And we can get lost if we do not tolerate the demands of love. See, the founders of our nation, they knew a lot about history and they knew a lot about faith. And they set out to build a great nation, one that was free, one that served God, and one that would not fail in the ways of the world. And they did just that. They did just that. We had a nation built on godly principles, one that had God at its very core. Our money has printed on it in God we trust and it's a reminder to everyone not to trust in the money but to trust in God they wanted everyone to be a, have a constant reminder of what it truly means and what truly matters in their life trusting in God so in my sermon a couple of weeks ago I pointed out where man had gone wrong even back in biblical times and I used the illustration that people had trusted in their own will first instead of trusting in God first. And that continues on today. It's been over 3,000 years since that portion was written, since those words have been put down, and we haven't changed our ways. We haven't changed our behavior, even though it was written in there, and it tells us exactly what not to do. See, the way that they had been acting was, hey God, you show me first, and then I'll trust in you. But the problem is, God should be first on the list every time. First on the list. And see then, as we trust in God, he will reveal these freedoms to us. He will reveal these gifts to us. He will reveal true freedom and true love as we grow in the Spirit. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 says, The Spirit says clearly that in the later times some believers will desert the, the Christian faith. They will follow spirits that deceive and they will believe the teaching of demons. These people will speak lies disguised as the truth. Their consciences have been scarred as if branded by a red hot iron. Wow. It's pretty powerful. It's a pretty powerful statement. But you see, people have been led astray. They've given up the very freedoms that they long for. In our world today, we get our faith tested on a daily basis. And it's only with the foundation and faith that we can overcome the things that come against us. The freedoms found in our faith, in unity with one another. And that's one of the biggest keys that I can tell you about is our faith has to be in unity with one another. We are the body of Christ, united together in faith and in love for one another. Our love for one another in communion with the spirit of holiness 
is what brings us together. God living in us is what will see us through. If we look at history, our nation prospered when we put our trust in God first. We became one of the greatest symbols of freedom in history, even when our founding fathers broke the ties to tyranny and oppression, they still understood the importance of unity. In the preamble to the Constitution, it's the first thing that's listed. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, and provide the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Right in the first, they put it in there, how important unity is, how much we have to join together and be together, regardless of race, regardless of creeds, regardless of anything else. We have to be joined together in love, in unity, in commune with one another. See, and if we follow through, we see it in the Pledge of Allegiance as well. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. So if you truly take that to heart and you truly understand what it means, it should stir something within you. It should create that desire to be a part of a bigger plan, a bigger picture of something more relevant than just simply ourselves. And sadly, many of our younger generation may never have heard these words. Many don't know our history because it's been cast aside. We started declining as a nation when we started removing things that bound us together as a nation. They stopped saying the Pledge of Allegiance in the classrooms. When I was in school, we said it every morning. We would open with a prayer, and we would say the Pledge of Allegiance. You see, we took that out of schools, and we took God out of schools. We took God out of the government. We took prayer out of the public forum. And our nation has succumbed to false narratives and teachings. Political correctness has corrupted our moral values, and Christianity has been vilified as being the center of all that's wrong within our country. Sound familiar? Sounds a lot like that first verse in Timothy, doesn't it? When we look at our world today, people are doing what they did back in that biblical times. They're putting themselves first instead of God first. They're putting God last. Our world today is a reflection of those misplaced values. And isn't it time that we take a lesson from our past? We need to step up and step out to be a living sacrifice for God. To put God first in our lives and make a difference in our world, starting with ourselves. The best place to change is starting within you. See, then if we are in unity with one another and if we are in unity with community, then that change will transform and it will conform us. And if we put God at the center of it, we will be conformed into the likeness. Let us pray. Gracious God, your love is big enough to surround the entire world. I ask today that the message you, you give us will transform us. That will conform us into that image of Jesus. That will help us to reach out to one another in love. To stand by and affirm one another, to lift each other up. Help us 
empower us, embolden us to step up and step out for you. Help us to be that living sacrifice in grace and in mercy and out of love. And mostly of all, Lord, help us to give hope to those in need, those who feel marginalized, those who are asking that question, is this all there, there is to life? Is there nothing more? Lord, empower us to go forth and be that voice to lift them up and to be that sacrifice that you call us to be. In your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. We are, as Mark said, Christ's living sacrifice here on earth. We are the embodiment of what he taught. And it still amazes me as, as we think about what he did on that night before he was given up. That he would have a meal with his disciples to tell them exactly what was going to be happening. He was more concerned about them at that point. Mark records it this way. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it into pieces, giving it to his disciples, saying, Take it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks for it. And he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. He says, I tell you the truth, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Two thousand years later, we continue to join each time we come together in that meal that he had, showing us and reminding us that we are his living sacrifice. If you haven't been with us before, just take the cellophane off the top to get at the wafer, the bread, and then you can open up the cup. The body and the blood of Christ. Thank you, Father, for what this meal represents. That we, each time we come together, that it reminds us of what your Son did for us on the cross. <clears throat> Let us be your living sacrifice here until you call us home. In Jesus' name, amen. We now enter that time of the, our service where we share our joys and our concerns praise reports. Uh, I know Diane has, has one for her cousin who is overseas. She has cancer and uh, is struggling with that a little bit. And to top it all off, she lost her fur baby. Her cap was uh, run over in the street and she lost it. Um, and then there's another uh, young gal. I, how old is she, Diane? Three. She was in a pool accident, and is, today is the day that they're going to determine whether or not they pulled her off life support. Well, a very difficult time for them. Does anyone else have anything that they would like to share? No? praying for your boss and that maybe he might just decide to join you some Sunday. I don't know. Anyone else? Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we just thank you for these spoken prayer requests, Father. 
We also thank you for those that have not been spoken, those that are on our prayer list. Father, if we have received anything online, we receive those and we lift those up to you right now as well, Father. It is in your hands that we know that you will take care. Whether that is a healing here on earth or a healing by taking someone home. But Father, we also pray for those who don't know you. Father, let us be Jesus to them. Let us be your beacon. Don't let us hide it from the world so that we can change, help change one person at a time because of a heart change. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to come before you and pray in Jesus' name.